Good afternoon. On today's Angry Bulletin, we are going to revisit a topic that I haven't talked about in quite some time, and that is Elon Musk's vision of the future on Mars and how that stacks up against his arch rival Jeff Bezos and his ideas of a colony built in the middle of Earth orbit called an O'Neill Cylinder. Which concept is better? Which is more realistic? And which one are we more likely to see in the near future, or are we unlikely to see either of these solutions, and are they just the dreams of overly ambitious and overly rich people who simply are looking far beyond what even they are capable of building? All of this and more coming at you on The Angry Astronaut right now. Good afternoon, and once again, welcome to The Angry Astronaut. Today, we are going to be departing from the rather unpleasant current affairs happening out in space, whether it be Starliner or the ISS being destroyed in the near future, all of those things, and instead, we're going to be talking about something a little bit more optimistic, that is to say, the prospects of human beings colonizing the solar system. And there are all kinds of scientists and social influencers, journalists, etc., who really seem determined to see to it that mankind never really gets to this point, to talk about how it's impossible or unpleasant, nobody's ever really going to want to do it, and after all, we should be focusing on our own planet and not talk about colonizing the solar system. I'm not going to go into great detail as to why all of these people are wrong. Suffice it to say that we have limited resources available here on Earth, resources that we are steadily destroying the environment in the process of exploiting. And if we were to instead exploit the resources of the asteroid belt, the rocky planets in our solar system, or even some of the moons of the Jovian worlds, that might be the best key to preserving the long-term value of our own planet. And this is something that Jeff Bezos actually concentrates on extensively in his ideas. But before we get to that, we're going to be quoting extensively from an article entitled, We Put Elon Musk's Dream to Colonize Mars Up Against Jeff Bezos' Vision of Living in Space, and One is More Realistic. Let's find out which solution is the better one. One would think that given that this is an article published by the mainstream media, that Elon Musk is not going to fare very well. Well, we'll find out, and I'm going to be including a lot of my own personal opinions. So, obviously we know that Musk has his sights set on Mars, saying that he wants to establish a permanent, self-sustaining human colony of a million people on the Red Planet by 2050. At this point, given Starship's current rate of advancement, that seems highly unlikely, but still, Let's assume that it's possible that getting a million people to Mars is doable. We're not talking about the process of getting them there. We are instead talking about the prospect of them living there. Bezos is actually more ambitious. He wants to build gigantic space stations in Earth orbit and elsewhere that would allow a trillion humans to live throughout the solar system. Although he says he won't see them in his lifetime, Bezos founded Blue Origin specifically to do this, to export the human population, or at least a lot of the human population and all of their damaging activities, such as heavy industry, mining, etc., and to put it out in space where it's not going to do any harm to our home planet. Now, both billionaires' aspirations come with major technical, scientific, and ethical hurdles. But according to experts in architecture, astrobiology, and artificial gravity and reproductive health, one vision of these two is more realistic. So first of all, let's talk about the construction barrier. Establishing habitats where humans can not only live but thrive is the biggest challenge in both billionaires' visions, and I would agree with this assessment. If you ask independent architect Anthony Longman which world is more feasible to build, 
Bezos's space stations are the way to go in the long run, because you can make them Earth-like more easily than an entire planet. As most of us know, Musk's long-term vision is to terraform Mars by giving it a thicker atmosphere with breathable oxygen and a protective magnetic field to shield it from harmful space radiation, so that one day humans could live on and explore Mars' surface like on Earth. Longman thinks transforming an entire planet is too challenging, which is why he says colonizing Mars is not a good idea. Bezos's space stations could be built to resemble Earth more easily, no massive terraforming being necessary. The scale Bezos envisions for these space stations, however, is unlike anything ever built. They would resemble a 70s concept that most of us are familiar with called O'Neill colonies, enormous cylinders measuring 20 miles or over 30 kilometers long and four miles or six kilometers wide that could hold a million people. Longman has his own concept for space habitats designed to house just 8,000 people. While he thinks that building a massive station like what Bezos imagines is more realistic, it's too big to be feasible in the near term. Quote, I'm not saying they won't be built, but I think it will probably be some hundreds of years before we're able to build it anything at that scale. With that said, Bezos is still the winner of this round. Score Bezos 1, Musk 0. So far, so good. Mainstream media is doing what we would anticipate. But I'll tell you, we've got some surprises waiting. Now, the second challenge, aside from shelter, is having enough food. And by the way, what you're looking at right now is a clip from some footage that I use in a Patreon video that I made that exclusively dealt with growing food on Mars and some of the challenges that we would face in doing that. And if you're interested in joining my Patreon channel that has a steadily growing library, I'll be adding another video this week. Well, all the details are in the description. Okay, enough self-promotion. Let's talk about food and let's also talk about the expert the Business Insider went to in order to try to get a verdict as to which scenario was best. It was astrobiologist Rebecca Gonclaves who they consulted on this one and they discovered that scientists have already grown a few crops on the International Space Station including tomatoes and lettuce but scaling up production to feed millions requires more research. According to Rebecca Gonclaves quote we need need to develop these very safe, closed-loop, self-sufficient agricultural systems. And she thinks this will actually be easier on Mars than in space. And that's because a planet already has a surface where humans can grow food, she says. In space, you would have to build farms from scratch and likely need to venture out to mine water and minerals from asteroids. Mars, on the other hand, has soil and water ice on its surface, or just a little bit beneath its surface surface, lots of water, and lots of regolith, which can be converted into fertile soil with bacteria that we already have here on Earth and that could be introduced to a Martian environment, or if you were concerned about contamination, all you'd have to do is actually bring the bacteria's enzymes in order to carry out that conversion. In the process, not only would you have fertile soil, but it would also produce breathable oxygen and rock rocket fuel is a byproduct. Again, if you're interested in all that, I've got a lot more details in the other video. But researchers have already made progress towards the goal of growing food in regolith because they've already grown it in lunar regolith and Gonclaves is working to develop a closed loop, self-sustaining agricultural system for Martian colonies. Quote, if I had to pick a billionaire's vision of the future, I would definitely go with Elon Musk's Martian colony and I completely agree with her. Out in space, you have to bring everything the water. And assuming, of course, that you're growing it in a hydroponic sort of environment, maybe you don't need the soil, but you need to bring everything else out there. And yes, once you have a greenhouse established, ultimately it could become self-sufficient, utilizing waste material in order to get new fertilizer, etc. But it's so much easier if you already have that stuff available to you, especially the water. 
So now we need to talk about artificial gravity. Now one would think that Bezos' solution would be the winner here because you can create a full G of artificial gravity out in space if you have a big enough station, but it's a little bit more complicated than that. As we all know, the human body doesn't adapt too well to low or zero gravity. Researchers have found that spending weeks to months in space can lead to muscle and bone loss, vision problems, and even kidney stones. This means that a space or Mars colony would need artificial gravity to keep its residents healthy. Mars has some built-in gravity already, about 38% of what we experience on Earth, but a space station would need to start from scratch. Now, I want to stop the article right here. We actually have no idea whatsoever as to what the effect of reduced gravity is going to be on the human body. We know how extreme things are when there's just microgravity, but 38% gravity? Really don't know. Is there going to be any muscle loss, any bone loss, and if so, how significant is that going to be when you at least have some gravity affecting your body? We aren't going to know these things until we carry out some pretty extensive experiments in this kind of environment. And the only way to do that is to create about a one-third artificial gravity habitat. And currently, the only company that's building a space station designed to do just that is the Orbital Assembly Corporation. And frankly, they aren't making very huge progress when we're talking about building one of these space stations, at least within the next 10 years or so. They're very optimistic and I'm actually impressed with some of their designs, but it's going to be a while before we really know what one-third gravity does to the human body. But let's just assume that the consequences are one-third as bad on Mars as they are out in space and in microgravity. There is no scientific reason to believe that, but let's say that that's the case. Well, there's a Rachel Seidler, who, by the way, is a professor of applied physiology and kinesiology at the University of Florida, who talks about the differences between natural gravity, even if it's just one third of the way there, as opposed to artificial gravity. Quote, artificial gravity is thought to be very difficult to implement in space. Bezos's enormous 20 mile long stations would rotate to simulate Earth's gravity, but getting that sort of Goliath up and running is really far fetched. And keep in mind, Artificial gravity is not exactly the same as real gravity. You're just using the centripetal force of a rotating space station in order to simulate that gravity. It really doesn't produce exactly the same effect. Are we going to be able to trick our bodies with centripetal force, or is this going to create a whole new collection of problems for people who spend months, years, or perhaps even their whole lives on space stations like an O'Neill cylinder. At this point, we really don't know. And since Mars has at least some gravity, these particular researchers who the Business Insider talked to felt that Mars was the better bet. And again, I tend to agree. But now we need to talk about the most difficult challenge of all, and that is in the field of reproduction. And by the way, just watching this takes me back. There was a moment of fear that uh, my ex-wife and I had when our child was only about, I think, three months old. I don't really recall exactly. There was a moment where we thought the fetus might have been in danger, and so we had an early ultrasound done, something that most people don't get to do, and I saw this little creature just swimming around happily inside the womb. It's a magical moment that I'll never forget. Anyway, let's stop talking about that and let's start talking about what happens to fetuses on Mars or out in space. If we're going to establish a long-standing colony off-world, obviously reproduction will be necessary. Now, a Russian experiment in 2007 showed us that giving birth and conceiving in space is at least possible after a cockroach named Hope, <laughs> a funny name for a cockroach, birthed 33 baby roaches and one of those roaches later conceived during the mission. However, as we all know, cockroaches aren't humans. Well, most humans anyway. And a lot of questions remain around how space radiation and low gravity would affect a developing fetus since we've never sent a pregnant person into space and likely won't 
for a long time given the potential risks. Even here on Earth in fully equipped hospitals, giving birth can be dangerous, obviously. So both Musk's Martian colony and Bezos' space stations would have to be equipped with healthcare systems identical to those on Earth, if not better, said Adam Watkins, professor of reproductive biology at the University of Nottingham. It's not clear to Watkins whether space stations or Mars cities would be a better place for giving birth. They may come with equal risk, because yes, Again, even though in theory we can produce a full G of gravity on a space station, this is centripetal force. It's not real gravity. Is that going to have a different effect on a developing fetus than it would have here on Earth? We really don't know. Obviously, reduced gravity on Mars is going to have at least some effect, but again, we really don't know. And we won't know until we actually try. So what's the verdict? What does Watkins think about all this? Well, quote, I think establishment of human colonies on Mars is more likely to occur before we have significant human colonies established on large structures in space, and so therefore we are more likely to see human babies on Mars before we see them in space. That's kind of a cop-out in my opinion, so we're just going to go ahead and call that a tie. And by the way, for those of you keeping track, Musk is ahead two to one. And by the way, this is where the Business Insider article comes to a conclusion. They, in their opinion, give Musk the win with three points to one as to having the most feasible colony. But that's a little disappointing. Are there not other factors that could really give a definitive victory to one side or the other? Well, in my opinion, absolutely. And that is the in situ factor. Out in space, there are no in situ resources at all. Yes, you can exploit the moon. Yes, you can exploit asteroids. But there is nothing where Bezos is planning to build these massive space cities that can be exploited. It's all empty space. At best, you're going to have to make use of the moon and the asteroids that don't have nearly as significant a gravity challenge as Earth does in order to realistically build something this colossal in low Earth orbit. Amazingly enough, it would actually be much easier to haul resources all the way from the asteroid belt to low Earth orbit rather than trying to haul them up to low Earth orbit from the Earth's surface, and that's simply because of gravity. The Earth's gravity is very strong, very difficult to overcome, and requires lots of power and lots of fuel in order to get there with any sort of substantial payload. Whereas Mars, most of the resources are right there. The metals, the regolith, which can be made into concrete, the water. And if you pile enough regolith on top of your habitat or just build your habitat underground, you've got your radiation shielding as well. In my opinion, that gives Elon Musk's vision a clear advantage over Bezos's dream of building these massive O'Neill cylinder space stations. Now, could both of them be done? Absolutely. Should both of them be done? Absolutely. But if we're talking about who's going to have the biggest challenge in trying to make something like this a reality, I think Elon's got the edge. As long as he can stay focused and keep his eyes on the prize and remember that creating a second habitat, a backup world, for our species to take advantage of should the worst happen to our civilization, which eventually it absolutely will. Well, Elon definitely has the edge. Thank you very much for watching. Really appreciate your support. Please like, please subscribe. Also, please check the description for various ways to support this content. And also find out how to get access to my Patreon channel. And as always, stay angry about space.